Welcome to Fat Logic, where the idea of drinking a glass of water is considered an eating disorder. Get in the basement, brings us. Tis the season, and it's a picture of Swole Santa carrying a present. It looks like Santa has given up cookies and has started eating Clan. This is a good ending. Santa was tired of being fat, but not for the reason you think. He didn't care about how others view him. He let others use their imagination and tell the story of Father Christmas whoever they want. Santa changed for himself. He wanted to be able to fit through the chimneys and carry as many gifts as he would like. His job is tough and it requires physical labor. Santa decided to do the hard work to better himself. The children are dependent on him. Now his job is easier. He can fit through the chimneys easily. Well, to be honest, his shoulders are so big now, I don't think he can, but let's continue. He can carry gifts and enjoy the holiday treats in moderation. Santa feels good about himself and proud of his hard work. It paid off. Someone replies, no, but seriously, why can't y'all just let Santa be fat in peace? And the same person adds, here's a photo of the delicious donuts I bought the other day and ate all by myself. Cry about it. It's a box of six donuts. Way too much for any human to eat. And I fear that they ate them all in one sitting. They must have felt gross after that. Then they add a picture of a cat drinking milk and write, hashtag bigots really do have the audacity, huh? Hashtag fatphobia, hashtag diet culture, hashtag ableism, hashtag concern trolls, hashtag healthism, hashtag trigger warning, food. A little bit late to give a trigger warning about food at the very end of your post, don't you think? Get in the basement gives us some context. Someone shared their positive and well-meaning interpretation of someone else's muscular Santa art in a reblog, and someone who runs an FA blog directly responded, completely unprompted, by posting a picture of a box of donuts that they admitted to eating alone. I had to split the response in two due to the size. The donut picture is immediately followed by the same person posting a cutesy cat person. Get in the basement continues, I'm not making this up. There isn't some missing sequence or cropped comment in between that adds additional context. They just randomly responded to the other person's reblog by saying they ate a box of donuts by themselves and told them to cry about it, completely and totally unprompted, because they didn't like someone else's muscular Santa interpretation about eating treats in moderation and working out. Ready or not gonna lie, also replies. As a recovering binge eater, I hate this stuff so much, and it's honestly kind of triggering. Binge eating should not be celebrated, just like starving oneself should not be celebrated. Katie Grants brings us something else about Christmas. There's always so much casual fat phobia during the holiday season. I went to Walmart and saw a sweater that said, torn between eating a snack or being a snack. You can't even enjoy anything without being told that you're worthless and not attractive. Fud Chimis in Thanksgiving. I found the shirt they're talking about. In case you're really interested, it's available on Amazon. It really does say torn between looking like a snack or eating one, which is obviously... A joke? You really have to be desperate to be insulted by this shirt. Grouchy Reflection replies, My protein shake shaker has, if only sarcasm, burnt calories printed on it. Got it as a gift years ago, because the person who gifted it knew it would appeal to my sense of humor, which it does. If I was a fat activist, I'd probably have yet another destroyed friendship, due to being constantly hypervigilant and looking for any perceived slights. It's like that thing where our caveman wiring has us seeing images of Jesus or Elvis in a slice of toast because we're primed to spot faces of rival tribes lurking in the trees, but it's fat phobia instead of Jesus toast. I believe what they're referring to there is pareidolia, which is where you see faces and things like that and things that don't have faces. And now a bunch of posts about a person who decided to leave the fat acceptance movement because they decided to lose weight because of the issues it was causing. The initial post was brought to us by El Faba. So I found out from y'all that there are some creators who are upset with my sharing of my personal experiences of troubles with personal hygiene when I was heavier. I've been called ableist, and there has been a think piece written about me that is floating around. Creators responsible for these opinions are absolutely entitled to their own opinions about my perspective. I'm blunt and sassy about my own experiences and I'm sure they can make people uncomfortable. I'd love to reiterate 
that my experiences and sharing of them continue to be valid. I didn't enjoy the experience of living in a body that was larger, and that's okay for me to say. That's my experience. I validate and see and enthusiastically cheer on anyone who lives in a body bigger than mine and finds joy in that. What you say about your own body is right. No one can take that authentic experience from you. I also notice that while these creators are well-intended, they seek to protect the hearts of fat people from shame, they also fail to notice that fat people are capable of seeing media and knowing when it doesn't agree with their specific values. So many people have unfollowed me after I shared my positive experience with weight loss, and I welcome that. I trust in your ability to see your true North Star and make decisions that allow you to feel safe. It is infantilizing to assert that fat people are betrayed and harmed by my lived experience. Additionally, I'd like to add that I have taken specific measures to remove myself from taking up space in the last two years intentionally. I have stopped using body positive hashtags as there are viewpoints within that community that I disagree with. My community on social media is full of people who are here by their own sheer will, and I am grateful for that. The people who follow me see me as a person, not a fat person, not a thin person. They see me as a woman who loves to review movies, talk about ghosts, is obsessed with Taylor Swift, loves her kitties, can get a little messy and defensive sometimes, and above all, loves to share it all. I share fashion content that is for bodies at different stages of size and life, and I am passionate about that and always will be. I left the body positive community because I wanted to be defined by my interests outside of my body. Online communities bring us so much validation and experiences we felt were isolating and ultimately find out are common and shared. I love that. I found that initially when I found the body positive community online. But eventually I noticed that if anyone wanted to lose weight for health, personal desire, or any other perspective, they were met with cruel and swift feedback. This to me feels unhealthy and dare I say, culty. Someone replies, have you ever thought for a moment that maybe it isn't the act of weight loss that is upsetting, but how you present it? Like, sis, maybe the problem is you. The way you are presenting this information into your universe of 189,000 perpetuates fat phobia rather than addresses it or neutralizes it. You're actively doing harm to the community that built your platform. You're wholly allowed to do whatever the fudge you want with your body. That isn't causing harm. What's causing harm is your ableist and fat phobic language. The OOP replies, I disagree, be well. And I know it's specifically about my language. My community knows what I'm about. And they are more than one group of people with one specific set of ideals and values. Thinking that there's only one kind of person who follows me and that they all think the exact same way is missing the mark. I've fielded quite a few DMs over the past 48 hours, and I assure you, ones like yours are in the point zero 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 one percentile. Also, I thought I blocked you years ago for constantly leaving heart emojis on my husband's posts. Okay, admittedly, I'm beginning to start to serve kitties. Jewish Space Medbeds replies, That commenter is lying. Fat activists regularly get angry at people for the simple act of losing weight and have repeatedly called losing weight fatphobic. Good grab. In fat acceptance land, there is no body positivity for anyone trying to lose weight or who is skinny. They describe a doctor trying to tell an obese person what being overweight is doing to their health as someone trying to kill a bunch of fat people. They say all former fat people have and promote restrictive EDs, then say they will all regain the weight. They also claim former fat people hated themselves when they were fat and hate fat people. They call skinny women skinny bees, skinny mini, thin mints, and compare them to 12-year-old boys, even if they haven't said or done anything to them. Grouchy Reflection brings us somebody replying to that person who said they were trying to lose weight. I don't know how many people miss that the most fat, liberated thing you can do is whatever the fudge you want with your body and, important and, refuse to talk about it publicly. Like, stop discussing weight gain and losses totally forever. They are neutral and boring and body autonomy means it's nobody's business. However, when you start posting diatribes assigning moral value to your weight loss or acting like your more fat body is, was, worse, that's anti-fatness, babe, and we're going to call you on it. And even if you're not talking poop about fatter people, we will never escape anti-fatness or diet culture if we keep letting it be okay to comment on or make assumptions about the way someone's body has or has not changed. It serves no one to discuss changes to your weight in a public forum because it lets the insidious idea that bodies are open for public discussion live on. 
Director of Flexion replies to that person, This person is a major FAHES grifter who has run several scams. Most recently a bizarre, we're going to build spa petting zoo for Infinifats. Give me your money via paying to name barnyard animals, bariatric golf carts, etc. That we might get in 5 to 10 years. Maybe. When the fictional animals and vehicles were named, she decided she didn't like them. So posted this goat that exists only in my fevered imagination. Doesn't like their name, so give me more money to rename it. She also ran a Yay! Super Morbid Obesity is Brilliant magazine that died on its butt within a matter of months due to lack of interest. Her whole thing is getting as much money as possible from fat women, so of course she's furious that aforementioned women are jumping the fat acceptance ship. Response answer brings us somebody else replying to the person who said that they lost weight and left the fat acceptance community. Weight doesn't mean anything, so I'm not sure why a before and after picture is how you're communicating this. If you're losing weight for health reasons, then you should be focusing on actual health measures and not size. The person we're talking about replies, I'm inspired by other creators who do before and after pics vids. This is the content I enjoy watching and creating. Smile. The person commenting on him adds, Well, if pushing anti-fat bias is your thing, I guess that's your thing to contend with. Just remember that over 90% of intentional weight loss diets fail, and when your body goes back to looking like the before pick, that's going to be an awkward place to exist. Book with a heart. And the original creator. This is a super rude comment. I hope you take some time to reflect on why you felt the need to say these things to me. Spoiler, they won't. And a third person. Okay, wow. I'm new to this creator, and your comment made me audibly gasp because of how rude and disgusting it was. I think you should look in the mirror and ask yourself why someone else losing weight and making lifestyle changes offends you so much. Clearly, projection. The person who was offended replies back, People intentionally losing weight doesn't offend me. Being part of the fat community and building a following under the guise of fat empowerment and then pulling a 180 that puts weight loss and a shrinking body at the forefront, rather than physical ability changes or even health metrics, is the issue. If one of your issues is not being able to wipe your butt, then a shrinking body is the thing that will solve that problem. And I would consider that a health metric. So in that sense, beyond a certain size, shrinking your body is a health metric. Anyway, they continue. My comment is rooted in scientific research. Over 90% of the people who pursue significant intentional weight loss gain it all back plus some within two years. That statistic's not right. Also, it ignores the fact that people who didn't pursue the weight loss would have gained even more weight in that time. They continue, so why is it so rude of me for pointing out that she's celebrating before and after fatphobic content, and when her diet most likely fails and how awkward that will be after taking this hard left that is so focused on a smaller body? It's true. It's why diet culture is so harmful. We never celebrate when someone gains weight, only when they lose it. So then, when people inevitably gain it back, it piles even more shame on. Green Admiral replies, Unlike you, Snowflakes, I'm not offended. An essay. Gratia Reflection brings us some more people commenting on the same creator. For context, the writer is a 600-pound infinifat and has disabled herself as a result of poor choices. Her partner isn't that far behind her. Both are fond of trying to play the disability card, which is highly offensive to people who are actually disabled, as opposed to intentionally choosing the bedbound life. I can't wipe my own butt, and I'm okay with it. Have you ever seen a social media post that punched you right in the gut? Another body positive influencer turned anti-fat mean girl is out here serving lukewarm takes in the new year. I'm not shocked. This is happening with frequency now. I think it's because we're all aging into our 30s, and our bones creak and muscles tense, and we're discovering our internalized ableism. So internalized ableism is when you intentionally don't want to handicap yourself? Learn something every day. They continue, while well, some of us are discovering and interrogating our internalized ableism, others have chosen to use their mobility challenges as motivation to rekindle that old flame with Mr. Shame. A rose by any other name still smells, like you think less of fat and disabled people, folks. Well, random influencer number nine, guess what? I can't wipe my butt either. I haven't been able to make the reach since 2020, when we were all first sent home for the pandemic, and I relied solely on my bidet. What can I say? I literally went nowhere. 
I lost my ability to reach and in all honesty haven't quite found my way fully back yet. I haven't spoken super publicly about this, but I've written about my experience with this particular challenge over the years on my Patreon. My friends and family know, and for the most part they all have bidet attachments in their homes too. And now it's finally time to say it loud and proud. I don't wipe my butt. Kiwi Von Fluffington replies, You couldn't pry this information out of my cold, dead hands. What the fudge? Anyway, they continue. It hasn't always been this easy to talk about. The truth is that I have felt a lot of shame about this, like when I spent hours in therapy talking about how my body has betrayed me so much that I couldn't even do something, as natural and standards wiping my own butt. I felt ashamed when I sobbed in front of my then supervisor, admitting to her that I couldn't return to work in person because I couldn't care for my toileting needs. I felt even more shame when I pursued an accommodation at my workplace, requesting that a bidet be put in place for me. I argued the case that this would be beneficial to many, not just me. Who else uses bidets? People with mobility challenges, temporary physical injuries, disabled people, folks of certain religions that require them to use a bidet for spiritual reasons, and yes, sometimes other fat people. I'm confused. Are they not coming into work anymore, or did they demand a bidet so they can continue to come into work? As they continue, what strikes me most about this post is the glaring ableism. The anti-fatness is almost to be expected. We're seeing many influencers ride whatever wave brings them praise and popularity, especially if it means they're hoping to transition into the realm of the straight-sized audience instead of being pigeonholed into the plus-sized world. I understand the desire to receive praise for fitting in and being a good fatty by pursuing weight loss. I'm sympathetic to those feelings. It's 2024. Ableism is boring. But ableism is a whole separate monster. And perpetuating harmful narratives is irresponsible for someone with a platform. So let me get this straight. The harmful narrative is saying that people who are extremely big have a hard time wiping their butt. But at the same time, this person admits that they can't wipe their butt because they're extremely big. So they admit that the narrative is true, they just don't like what it's saying. What an absurd take. Anyway, they continue. The language in the post is a reminder that as a culture, we completely devalue the lives of disabled people. We have this preconceived notion of what a life worth living looks like. And it certainly does not include people who need help toileting. How many times have you heard someone say they'd f*** themselves that they couldn't wipe their own butt? I've never heard anyone say that. I've heard it a few times in my own life, personally, and many times on television. All it takes is just to have one disabled friend to recognize how worthwhile their lives are. I guess you're showing your freshly TP chaffed butts. If you couldn't think of one person that post might be harmful to, the fact of the matter is that there are people out there living full worthwhile lives who also need assistance or adaptive devices in the bathroom. When will we as a culture start interrogating our narrative around what kind of life is worth living? I'm going to say what everybody's probably thinking here. There's a difference between somebody overeating to the point that they can't wipe their butt and somebody being unable to wipe their butt because they got paralyzed in some way or something like that. They're totally different circumstances. And I don't think blaming somebody for a problem they caused to themselves is unjustified. Crafty Table brings us Pulmonary hypertension is usually diagnosed in people ages 30 to 60. It continues and says, other things that raise the risk of pulmonary hypertension are being overweight. That's circled. And then they underline uses of certain drugs, including some weight loss medicines, implying that because somebody's overweight, they take certain weight loss medicines, and that gives them pulmonary hypertension. Here's the thing. Pulmonary hypertension has an increased risk for people who are overweight, even if they don't take those meds. And if your doctor believes that pulmonary hypertension is being caused by certain weight loss meds, they'd take you off those weight loss meds. So any correlation between the two would be weak at best. But the person continues with their argument anyway. They write, it's almost as if, and hear me out, this society is a fat phobic cycle. Magnifying glass, thinking, writing, books, Light bulb slash S. Doesn't really make sense. First phase of cycle, fatness is viewed as an inherent health problem. Second, doctors then focus on only treating a person's fatness and nothing else. 
Third, society judges and discriminates against the fat person. Fourth, the treatment and oppression by society lead to actual health problems. Fifth, society points to those health problems as proof that fat people are literal diseases. Sixth, weight loss corporations and all other industries that use fat people's oppression for their gain then utilize this proof to enforce fat phobia even more. Seventh, capitalism profits off this group society couldn't give less of a poop about. Eighth, repeat. Look, if this person actually believed this, and I don't think they do, but if they actually did, they'd run through the numbers and check to see if this is true. Check to see if the risk of pulmonary hypertension increasing due to being overweight is entirely due to them taking certain medications, or if it's not. I would give it a 99% chance that it's not. All they've done is throw some straws together and claim that they've made themselves a skyscraper. Honestly, the first little pig did a better job of building his house. And he got eaten. They continue, it's time to stop confusing the independent and dependent variables here. Modworthy. Hellscape Refuge replies, I'm sure they're referring to the FenFen debacle of the 1990s. It was taken off the market for causing pulmonary hypertension. Of course, nearly all the current FAs were either very young children or were born after it was pulled from the market in 1997. They have no standing to blame it for the respiratory problems. Dorkita brings us. Trigger warning, health, dying, intentional weight loss. I have pulmonary hypertension and heart failure. Pulmonary hypertension is a terminal illness, and the only cure for it is a double lung transplant. Unfortunately, in order to qualify for that, I would need to lower my BMI significantly. For my mental health and well-being, I stopped dieting and focusing on the number on, on the scale and have been trying to get more with my body and its needs. So let me get this straight. For their physical health, they stopped focusing on maintaining a healthy weight. Then they got pulmonary hypertension and heart failure, suggesting that perhaps these problems were caused by them no longer maintaining a healthy weight. But let's not expect that kind of introspection here. They continue. I feel caught between a rock and a hard place. I've suffered with an eating disorder and disordered eating for many, many years and finally feel like I'm mentally in a healthy place with that. To have to diet and lose weight for a lung transplant seems so detrimental to my mental health, yet if I don't do it, I will die. I know it's hard for fat activists to believe this, but it's entirely possible to diet in a perfectly healthy way that does not lead to an eating disorder. If you're having troubles with that, please talk to a health professional. They can doubtless either help you or find someone who can help you. Just using the fact that when you were 16, you suffered from anorexia for a year as an excuse to get up to 600 pounds and cause yourself pulmonary hypertension doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? They continue, To complicate matters further, I have a pituitary tumor which makes losing weight extremely difficult. It would not be a small undertaking. I feel so stuck and unsure of what to do. Do I put my mental health or my physical health first. Neither. You focus on both at the same time. How is that not obvious? Eating yourself to the point that you get pulmonary hypertension and you no longer can get surgery because you weigh too much, it's pretty clear that your mental health is not on point and you need to work on it. They continue. Is there a way to do both and still maintain my health and my beliefs about fat liberation and dieting? I guess I just wanted to put this out into the world and get some other people's thoughts on the subject. I'd be open to advice, but understand that this is such a difficult topic. Thank you all so much for reading. Here's the thing. It depends on what you mean by fat liberation. If you mean the idea that fat people shouldn't be picked on, then it has nothing to do with it at all. If you mean the false belief that being extremely fat has no effect on your health, well, you're going to need to change that belief because it's wrong as you've experimentally proven on your own body. Pulmonary hypertension, by the way, is caused by blood clots that block the pulmonary arteries. You may be offered anticoagulant medicines to prevent more clots forming. What the source I found said about transplants, in severe cases, a lung transplant or a heart-lung transplant may be needed. This type of surgery is rarely used because effective medicine is available. It's also worth pointing out that getting a lung transplant is not a pleasant thing to go through, and I believe you'd end up having to take drugs that suppress your immune system for years, perhaps the rest of your life, which in my opinion is way worse than putting the effort in 
to eat healthier and lose a few hundred pounds. Wrong Sunday replies. This is honestly so messed up and sad. I hope they get out of the echo chamber and get real mental health help. They'll be more open to proper self-care then, including making necessary lifestyle changes to qualify for life-saving surgery. The original OP talks about preserving their mental health, but what they're really talking about is not stepping outside of their comfort zone, owning that discomfort, and holding themselves accountable. Crouchy Reflection brings us one of the first posts about the New Year's. As a fat person, having to prepare to hear New Year's Eve resolutions on social media and in my life. And while Ozempic is hot in the streets for weight loss, I think it's necessary to communicate this. When you embark on a weight loss journey, in the hopes of being permanently in a thinner body, it's difficult to fully understand what that means. The weight loss medication or behaviors you are engaging in must continue for the rest of your life if your objective is to keep the weight off. This often requires that you have a mental preoccupation with your body weight your whole life, your whole life fixated. Let's take that at a 100% face value. Your choices are dying an early death or spending a few minutes every day worrying about your weight and trying to eat healthy and getting some exercise. Which one do you think is worse for you? Also, it's perfectly possible to maintain your weight at a healthy level without focusing on your weight all the time if you focus on eating healthy foods all the time, at least for most people. They continue. The other thing to name is that most people find that weight loss pursuits make them gain weight long term. They feel like it's their fault they couldn't maintain and feel ashamed once they inevitably stop the program diet. I know very few fat people who have not engaged in diets and programs more than once only to become fatter once it ended. Did you know that it would be impossible not to? Because if they'd actually successfully engaged in their diet or program, they would no longer be fat. So what they found is that people who fail at diets and programs tend to fail at diets and programs. Wow, so deep. How are they not embarrassed writing this crap on the internet, where everyone can read it? They continue. However, I want to say full-throatedly, weight gain as a byproduct of dieting is an aspect I don't give a poop about. That's fine, because it's not really real. I think that being fat is actually desirable. Body size is an arbitrary characteristic. Well, which one is it? Is it desirable or arbitrary? Hmm? Again, I don't think they're thinking before they're writing. They continue. And that being fat doesn't preclude you from being able to properly care for your body or be healthy. They say that, but we had some posts earlier about people unable to wipe their own butts. That is a strong case of not being able to take care of your own body. And we had another person who ate themselves into such a state that got pulmonary hypertension. Again, clearly they're not able to take care of themselves properly. They continue, Whoever y'all are going ape poop out there with ozempic and fixations on weight loss, and I have seen a tenfold increase in my life of people talking about their bodies critically and still thinking weight loss is the answer for health reasons. Just because of science and facts and other horrible things to do with our universe that we live in. They continue. If your objective is to lose weight, regardless of the health ramifications of rapid weight loss, weight gain, then diets and appetite suppressants or anything else that forces you to eat less than your basal metabolic rate will be temporary. In order to maintain a specific size, unless you are genetically thin, you must continue to disordered eating or medication for the rest of your life. It's not disordered eating to eat at a level that maintains your weight. They're such a ridiculous person. Although their concern about being forced to use Ozempic for the rest of your life is reasonably well-founded, since many people who get off Ozempic gain the weight back. Ozempic, for all of its usefulness, isn't really great long-term because of its very high price. I suspect that within a few years, there will be a way of weaning people off Ozempic with a reasonably high success rate that allows them to maintain their weight loss. But I don't believe we're there yet. They continue, when you stop the diet, it's not an if, it's a when, or lose access to the medication. Your body will be ravenous. You may even feel out of control. You will gain weight. You will likely believe that this out of control feeling is further confirmation that you must continue the disordered behavior. They write that, but I've read of some people who, after Ozempic and other weight loss drugs, feel more in control than they were before they took the medication. 
which I suspect is due to their insulin sensitivity improving, and other things like that. They continue, and once again, for many people, they will become fatter. This is uncomfortable to talk about as a fat activist, because it can be interpreted as encouraging people to stop dieting for the purpose of having less fat people in the world. Or if you think my body is gross, here's how to avoid looking like me. None of it feels particularly good. But I still think it's worth saying for folks who have a volatile and punitive relationship to their bodies, because no one needs to suffer with those kinds of thoughts or behaviors like that for years on end. I truly hate this for all of us. I hate that people feel pressure to be thin and perform health. I don't know what perform health means. What is actually sustainable for you long term? If you're reaching for these quick fixes, I feel for you. Your health is your business. But I just know that I felt anxious about my body for literally decades under the guise of health, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I assume that they no longer care, and pretty soon they'll be worried about their body because of the fact that they're sick and ill. They continue, I want your mind to be open and ready for joy, for fun, for peace. Every minute you look around to assess everyone else's body and compare it with your own, or engage obsessively with weight loss, pursuits, you lose time. Imagine the afternoon you have with your kids spent instead trying to fill your weight loss prescription medication. And then what do your kids learn? Prioritizing thinness at all costs is normal, healthy, morally good, and something important to do. If you think suppressing your appetite will not have long-term effects, you're wrong. This example is absurd. Most people who lose weight find that they're able to spend more time with their kids and have more energy and are more willing to play things like tag or hide and seek. Again, I could care less if you gain weight, and I honestly think the world would be better if there were more fat people. But since it's literally driving y'all to madness out there, with paying exorbitant money for GLP-1s and intermittent fasting and whatever else weight loss solutions people are peddling. Wait, how does somebody peddle intermittent fasting? Skipping breakfast isn't something you can sell, is it? I just wanted you to know, there's something way bigger, better, healthier than prioritizing weight loss. You know what was fascinating? After I accepted my body, I began to truly, actually, honest to God, care for it. Once the condition of being thin was not on the table, I learned about what health looked like for me, in my body, in my genetics. I learned about intuitive eating and asked myself what kind of movement I actually like to do. I stopped the punitive workouts. I stopped rewarding myself for skipping meals. It was a long process, but it wasn't impossible. It's never too late to stop the cycle and try something different. At the end there, it seems like when they were dieting, they had more of an eating disorder than were doing a proper diet. I've already mentioned this, but it's entirely possible to diet without having an eating disorder or to approach it in an eating disorder way. There are many reasonable techniques out there. They include things like intermittent fasting, which is usually like eating two or three meals a day and no more, or going keto works very well for some people, or tracking your calories that works very well for some people, although it's important when you do it to also track your protein and fat to make sure you're getting enough. Other things that work are things like intuitive eating, but instead of using the word intuitive, you think of it as intelligent eating, where you notice what effects individual foods have on your body and either eat more or less of them in the future based on that. Enley Jones replies, Being fat does not preclude you from being able to properly care for your body or be healthy. Because all those people on my 600-pound life are shining examples of great health and hygiene. Grouchy Reflection also replies, Nothing says I don't care about your weight loss like writing an entire sermon about how little you care about weight loss. Also, her lack of understanding about weight loss shines through in the lines about eating under your BMR for the rest of your life. As we know, your BMR is the amount of calories you burn by simply being alive. If you were in a coma, you'd still burn those calories. To lose weight, you eat slightly under the total number of calories burned. You could shave a hundred calories off a day and still lose weight, although very slowly. About one pound a month. We also do plenty of daily activities that we will do for life. I'm not fixated on clipping my toenails, showering, shaving my legs, dyeing my roots, brushing my teeth, flossing, etc. Eating properly and getting a bit of exercise is no different. As for the you'll be on meds for life rant, I'm going to point out the ableism these people screech about. 
I've been on asthma medicine since 1983, and that's unlikely to change. I'll also be on ADHD and bipolar meds forever. It's not that big a deal. The line about little Timmy will see you get your prescription and it'll make him anorexic. My cousin developed anorexia after her father died young. If anything is going to make little Timmy anorexic, it'll be burying his morbidly obese mother before he even graduates high school. Get in the basement brings us. Your January reminder that two people who work on their body and eat right in the exact same way can look entirely different. Thin people justify thin pride or thin privilege by just being proud of the body I worked so hard for is utter fatphobic tosh and BS. Happy New Year. Happy have replies. Even if that was true, so what? There's loads of times multiple people work equally hard on something, but only one finds success. It's like saying an actor shouldn't celebrate the Oscar win they spent their whole career working toward because Daniel Day-Lewis spent six months living as an emu farmer for his role. Autotelica also replies, If I express pride in something I've done, I'm not pooping on someone else's efforts. I'm just happy about what I have done. And heck yes, I'm proud of my toned legs. They remind me that all the running and climbing I've been doing for the past four months has changed me for the better, both physically and mentally. Would I gush about my toned legs in front of someone who I know is struggling with body issues? No, I would not. But toned legs do look better than fat legs. I'm never not going to believe this. Sned Limpen brings us, No need to go on a diet. You don't need to lose weight as a New Year revolution. I think they meant to write resolution, but you know, revolution's actually kind of funnier. You do not need to feel shame for gaining any weight over the holidays, and for enjoying yourself and the food. You do not need to tolerate diet talk after setting a boundary, and if someone can't respect that, then they're being the jerk. You already have a summer body. You already are hot. There's no moral failure or shame in being fat. Hashtag you gotta do the stretch though. Hashtag it's good for your back. Big smile and emoticons. It amuses me to no end to know that they think that stretching is super important, but every other part of taking care of yourself, stupid and a waste of time. Mika draws replies, know what else is good for your back? Not being obese. Kaz Wixads brings us on a video about not wanting to be a diet grandma. Someone replies to the video, that's true, but I want to prioritize being healthy in my youth so I can be healthy when I'm older. But I also love sweets, so I always indulge if I want to. The non-dieting grandma replies, Good thing people can be healthy and unhealthy at any size. That's a pretty evasive answer. Sure, you're more likely to be unhealthy at a huge size, but you can be unhealthy at any size. Technically true, I win! Someone else, No, it's about being healthy, at least for me. Caring about what I eat or how much because I know it affects my body and how it feels and what's the point of living if it's not to the fullest. The grandma, people of all sizes experience joint pain and mobility issues and weight loss as a solution is not evidence-based. Right, right, right. So losing 100 pounds will not make your knees feel better? <laughs> I think I smell some BS. Lionel Hutt's apprentice replies, Honestly, I have neither the patience or crayons to explain to them why it's bad to be obese. There's no arguing with people like that. They'll drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. P Popsicle brings us. Yes, if you're fat, you're going to die. But wait, if you're thin, you're going to die too. Hashtag facts. Now, can we please stop terrorizing fat people with the fear of death? Burner for Fat Logic replies, Ah, yes, terrorizing fat people with the fear of death, because that's exactly what I think when I see scientific fact that scientists are deliberately trying to terrorize me specifically. My pale skin puts me at higher risk for skin cancer? How rude. I can't believe you would terrorize me like that. Pollution could kill the planet? Stop terrorizing people. Drunk driving increases your risk of accidents? Well, now you're just trying to guilt trip and fear monger our poor, innocent alcoholics. How dare you? Slash S. Sad clown with a big rod brings us. Somebody who thought it was great to write in dark purple on a black background. Honestly, can anything be as bad as these god-awful color choices? 
In case some of you fudge butts are confused, fat phobia is on the same level as racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, sanism, and literally any other kind of oppression. Want to know why? Because being fat is genetic. Nope. You can't change being fat any more than you could change your skin color or orientation or disabilities or whatever. Not true, people lose fat all the time. Fat is so reliant on genetics that the vast fudging majority of people are physically unable to get to the healthy weight. Also, not true, but it's very challenging for some people, and some people find the challenge too large to overcome. That's why the studies saying fat is genetic and weight loss is futile are becoming more and more common. There really aren't any studies that say that. Because people are waking up to the fact that personal responsibility when it comes to weight loss is a myth. It's a myth. You can pull sources out of your butt if you want to argue with me, but I'm not sourcing my own fudging worth as a human being for your burden of proof. That argument literally makes no sense at all. And in case you're getting poopy with me about me comparing fat phobia to other oppression, I'm blasian, gay, trans, disabled, and ND, so you can all sit the fudge back down and stop arguing things you so obviously know nothing about. This one's for tossing replies, and in case you're going to get poopy with me, I'll have you know, I've already won the oppression Olympics and will scream and cry until I get my way. JPL replies, it's a myth that you can lose weight through lifestyle changes. Except when you actually make those changes. I started tracking what I ate, started exercising, kept within my TDEE, and lo and behold, I'm down 65 pounds, and yes, it's long term. I started the process 15 years ago, lost 50 pounds in 9 months, and kept it off until about 3 to 4 years ago when I lost another 15. My wife started eating better, working with a nutritionist, and wow, what do you know? She's down about 20 pounds so far and counting. My 76-year-old, extremely sedentary mother, who is currently morbidly obese because of her crappy diet, and is suffering from edema in her legs thanks to that obesity, and who is on medication that slows her metabolism to a crawl, is now down about 10 pounds in the last couple of months. Her secret? I changed her diet on her. Her Christmas present was literally a basket full of lower-calorie, higher-fiber, higher-nutrition foods to replace her current slate of crap. Since my brother and I do her shopping for her, we have total control over what we buy her. And despite the fact that she can barely walk, much less exercise, and despite her slew of meds that slow her down further, even with all the Christmas cookies, she's been losing weight. My mother-in-law picks my brain over improving her nutrition, has cut back her portions, and wow, she's lost weight too. Amazing! Despite the fact that her mobility is also inhibited because of the dual knee replacement she had done a few years ago. But sure, genetics. Whatever. Crafty Table brings us. So many skinny people will not gain a pound without extreme overeating and barely put in any effort into staying skinny, and then they'll assume that's a universal experience. The fat people must be stuffing their mouths at every moment they're not actively seen by a thin person. That's all it takes to be skinny, is 30 minutes of yoga a day. I'm going to stop them there for a second. You don't need to exercise at all to lose weight. And you don't need to be stuffing your mouth constantly to gain weight. All you need to do is eat slightly more than you burn every day and you will gain weight. Even if it's only 100 calories a day, that's about a pound a month or 12 pounds a year. Anyway, they continue. They wouldn't be able to fathom the fact that there are naturally fat people and that so many fat people are starving themselves every day but are still fat. What do they think the word starving means? Clearly, they have a misunderstanding of it. Being hungry is not starving. Being hungry and still gaining weight suggests that your diet is actually quite bad and that you're eating foods that aren't filling. They think having a smoothie and going to the gym for an hour three times a week is all it takes to maintain thinness. So the only thing they can think is that fat people must be eating a full pizza and 10 snacks a day. Hashtag worthy thoughts. Hashtag fat phobia. I had a roommate in college. Let me tell you, he was a great guy. But he was obese. He had a problem with food. He would eat the vast majority of a full pizza about three to four times a week. He'd get hungry around eight, nine, ten o'clock at night and just order one. A large pizza. And just sit down and eat the whole thing. So it's not completely unfair to say that some obese people will eat a whole pizza by themselves. It does not make them bad people. 
It does suggest something is going wrong with their body, though, and that their hunger levels are beyond what they should be. Get in the Basement has a similar experience. As a thin person that currently lives with an obese person that literally ate an entire frozen pizza by themselves in addition to multiple snacks as soon as they got back from the gym yesterday night, them denying that obese people eat a full pizza is wildly funny to me. Princess Peppermint replies to, If you think you're starving yourself and not losing weight, count calories. Spend a whole week tracking everything you eat, even drinks. A lot of people forget liquid calories still count, especially alcohol. Your latte, soda, orange juice, and a glass of wine all have calories. It's really easy to underestimate how much you're eating. You can easily be hungry and still overeating if you're filling up on liquid calories or eating high-calorie foods that won't fill you up. For example, some Starbucks drinks are 400 calories. That's the same as a meal, but you'll still be hungry after a Starbucks drink. Crafty Table brings us. It's pretty messed up, and also very telling that out of all the times I've ever seen media tackle the theme of, you don't have to starve to be beautiful, meet beauty standards, be loved, get the guy, etc. It has only ever been about thin people. I can't tell you a single instance where media portrayed the person starving themselves due to diet culture or anorexia or what have you as fat. I'm going to point out again that the word starving does not mean what they think it means. Starving, at least as far as I know, means eating so little that you're on the verge of dying from not getting enough food. It does not mean being hungry for a little bit. If they continue, it's only ever a thin person, and usually a thin girl specifically. You know, this kind of sounds like it's a problem with the media they're consuming. Certain media is very pandering, and they should be aware of that. Although I suspect that this person's not very experienced with the world. They continue, with how fatphobic this world is, how much cruel oppression us fat people are forced to endure, it's disgusting that the people being told they don't need to starve to have worth are not the people affected most by that fatphobic ideology. No, only thin people are allowed the grace of not having to starve, but us fatties can keep at it until our bodies deteriorate from the physical abuse. What a shocker that fat people are turned away from eating disorder, recovery, resources, when what we grow up watching tells us that only the conventionally beautiful are pure enough to deserve the fulfillment of a basic human survival need. Modworthy. Modworthy, please get some help. I think a psychologist or psychiatrist, if you, if you just spent a few hours talking to one, you could deal with the fact that you have all these eating disorder issues and maybe find yourself in a much healthier place. For example, you wouldn't be ranting on the internet all the time about other people having issues that don't affect you personally. Book Hermit replies, I wonder if Worthy considered the starving person was probably overweight at one point and starved themselves down to a low weight. But that would be acknowledging that eating less made you lose weight instead of gain it magically from starvation mode. So probably not. New name. FAs, thin people are starving themselves. Also FAs, calories in, calories out is BS. Please make it make sense. Amy Krista also replies, Worthy, fat people who starve themselves due to anorexia do not stay fat people, no matter what Tess Holiday would like you to believe. If you are starving yourself, you will lose weight, period, end of story. You do not have some magical biology that allows you to eat nothing and stay fat just as thin people don't have magical biology that allows them to eat 3k calories a day and stay thin. I really feel for this mod-worthy person. She seems like a deeply troubled soul, and one who is addicted to being a victim. As someone who has never been obese, but in my youth had a massive victim complex, worthy, if you're lurking here, it will never make you happy. The world is never going to fall at your feet as a result of your proclaiming your victimhood on the daily. All it does is repel people and make them not want to be around you. I suspect it's probably more your attitude than your weight that causes your social issues. Because I know any number of fat people who are happy, well-loved, in fulfilling relationships, and living productive and happy lives. Meanwhile, my ex, six foot two and lean, became my ex because he was so addicted to being a victim. A guy who had so much going for him. Cute, bright, funny, thoughtful, creative, etc., but he'd had a really rough childhood, and even in his 30s, he could not leave it behind. So ultimately, I had to leave him behind. If you're constantly playing the victim, nobody's going to want to be around you. It's never going to have the effect you seem to think it will. Go to therapy and work through your stuff. I'm begging you. 
Chris Vesper brings us. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Equals, I would rather forgo the things my body needs to survive in order to keep thin privilege. That's how important it is to me that I keep the ability to step on fat people. Don't hide what you really mean. If you're just maintaining your weight, you're not depriving your body of things it needs to survive. You're just not increasing the amount of fat you have. Isn't that obvious? I guess not. Not when you're a victim. Hefty Dig brings us. My aunt has been fat her whole life, trying each new diet under the sun every time another comes out. No amount of self-hatred ever made her thinner. Nobody should spend their lives hating themselves, even if it did make them thinner. Sounds like their aunt needs to actually learn how to properly lose weight. There's only about three or four good diets out there. All the other ones are variations on those. So if they're constantly trying a new diet, then clearly something is failing them. Probably they're sabotaging their own diets in some way. They continue, most of us, after a few months of exercise, plateau in weight because our metabolism has self-preservation baked into it, and the human body has limitations. That's not how it works at all. If you plateau in weight after a couple months, your calories in and calories out have become equal. Either you've slowly increased the amount of food you've been eating because it's harder to stay strict over long term, or you're working out less slowly over time. It's hard to know which of those two things is going on without, you know, talking to a person individually. But the most important part of it is to actually be honest with yourself, which I realize based on how many people claim they're starving yet gain weight every year, is something that a lot of people have a hard time doing. They continue, you just can't work out 25 hours a day. You shouldn't work out 24 hours a day, not even for the 16 hours that you're awake. In the same way, you can't train away your need for sleep, food, oxygen, or water. And again, you don't need to exercise to lose weight. At all. They continue. How often have you really seen a fat person eat more than a thin person? Quite often in reality. Who are they trying to kid here? Enough to compensate the weight disparity between them and their thinner peers? Yes. Restaurants have standard portion sizes. I've only ever seen all people eat as much as each other. If we all ordered the same thing off the menu, we'd all be eating the same amount. When I speak to my thin friends, they also reveal their exercise regimens to be as varied as those with bigger bodies. Overall, none or very few of us are professional gymnasts. Fat phobia isn't rational, helpful, or harmless. Good Grab replies, How many people has the OOP seen around the clock to know everything they're eating on a normal day? That skinny person eating out once a month is different than the morbid obese person eating out twice a day, and the weight shows it. Machinists Yep, I have so many skinny friends where, yeah, they'll absolutely demolish a burger and tots and a couple of beers, but they haven't eaten all day and will probably eat super light the day after. Pea Popsicle I love that their argument is that all restaurant meals are the same size. Are they aware that many of us eat home-cooked meals the majority of the time because restaurants have unhealthily large portions? And nowadays, incredibly high prices. Fluffy Kitten brings us. Your BMI can tell you that you're obese when you're in fact underweight for your size. BMI is severely flawed at best. Awkward kaleidoscope. Or 74% of US adults are actually obese by body fat versus the 36% that are obese by BMI. According to a Medscape article. Let's look. This is by Mitchell L. Zoller. Chicago. Twice as many adults have obesity. Based on assessment of their fat volume by DEXA scan compared with a measurement of their body mass index, a finding that highlights the shortcomings of BMI and adds to the growing case that BMI alone should not be the default gauge for obesity. That is to say, it's the exact opposite of what fat activists are claiming. BMI is too lenient and needs to be stricter. Okay, this one was actually posted in Language Learning Jerk, a subreddit designed to make fun of people who take language learning too seriously by OK Marzipan. Duolingo and diet culture. I'm in recovery from a severe ED and was almost hospitalized a couple of years ago. I notice, and perhaps it's more so in some courses, but most of the health-related sentences are very biased toward weight loss. The French course has several sentences like, I should not snack. He should do more sport. I advise you to eat less sweets. Sweets are bad for your health. Like, I get that duo is just using basic patterns and phrasing to teach me 
je te conseille et il me conseille, for example, reflexive verbs, a devrais, devrais, etc., should. But can it maybe have some sentences which reflect that not every piece of health advice should be eat less, eat less, exercise more, sweets bad, exercise good? Like, I'm not kidding when I say it makes me practice this lesson at least once a week. I know many cultures would have sentences like this in common parlance, but it's pretty blatant weight stigma. Never Colm replies, That's because it's French. It's preparing you for even worse things, Parisians will say to you. Tampa Vice adds, Yeah, really, outside of the first world English-speaking countries, they have no problem calling you fat. Marie Madeline replies, As someone who has an ED, I feel bad for this person, but part of recovering is accepting that you will see things that trigger you or make you feel uncomfortable. Like I wouldn't expect Duolingo to remove things about ordering wine at a restaurant just because I was an addict. Ectoelectric. We need a Ludo Dingo course for American English that says you should eat more hamburgers and exercise less. Crafty Table brings us Snack season. Listen, we're all adults here. We know we're supposed to eat healthy and exercise and all that, but here's the thing. It gets old. I just really like cheesecake, you know. But this week, your challenge is to break up with diet culture and eat something you love. Heart, are you a cheeseburger person? Have a cheeseburger. Do you love your protein shake? Great. I want to see some man versus food level snacking happening, people. Happy eating. Hashtag diet culture dropout. Hashtag diet culture. Hey, to anyone listening, please don't go man versus food with your protein shakes. There is a limit to how much protein you should have in a single day. It also will not make you feel good drinking massive amounts of protein in one sitting. I'm also pretty strict with my diet, but I still have a cheeseburger every week. My god, what do they think people eat when they're dieting? Book Hermit replies, I know we're all supposed to brush our teeth daily and wash our sheets every week, but that gets old. Eating gummy worms before bed and rolling around trying to escape sugar for the next two weeks is just so fun and freeing. Divest yourself from hygiene culture and disregard future consequences so I don't need to feel like so much of a grub. Get in the basement brings us. Thinking about how being fat means you're denied a very large portion of what's considered a normal and healthy part of the human experience. Hashtag like falling in love. Hashtag having friends? Hashtag or being desired? Hashtag or getting compliments? Hashtag feeling good or confident? Hashtag getting to eat food? Hashtag getting to curate what you wear and your style? Hashtag appropriate healthcare? Hashtag equal pay? Hashtag you know? Hashtag the little things that shape us? Hashtag fat phobia? Get in the basement replies to themselves. How are you being denied? Who is denying you? I'm asking as someone that knows multiple plus-sized people with different backgrounds, with thriving social lives, friends, and fiancés, partners in real life. I agree that navigating certain social environments can vary based on your body types or appearances. But who is denying you those experiences exactly? A guy whose name I can't say brings us. Somebody writes in response to something. Body weight too. Having overweight children is a form of neglect, abuse, because they don't cook, buy groceries, or make their own plates. And someone replies, this is stupid. A lot of overweight kids have overweight parents. It's genetics. Secret Fudge replies, so the food that a person buys for their household and feeds to their child, the same food that helped make them overweight themselves, that is genetics. Fire Pro replies, when I was at school, there was one fat kid in the class. One. I don't believe the genetics excuse at all. If you eat and exercise correctly, then you'll be a healthy weight. Not a big Melville crowd, also replies. When I switched schools in the sixth grade, I went from a class with one fat kid to a class with none. I actually can't think of a single kid in the whole school who was more than slightly chubby. That was less than 30 years ago. I also had the same experience. I think there was one fat kid in my whole grade of like 500 kids. Clearly, something has changed socially or with the food we're eating. Blaming genetics just doesn't make any sense. Ready or not gonna lie brings us. I have PCOS and it makes it incredibly difficult to lose weight. On doctor's orders, I was eating 1,100 to 1,200 calories a day and running a mile a day and I barely lost anything. I did this for two years and my physical and mental health only got worse. 
It wasn't until I injured my foot running and developed some severe depression that I finally was forced to give up my healthy lifestyle. When I ate, instead of focusing on calorie restriction, I focused on reducing glucose spikes and inflammation. Instead of overexercising to burn calories, I did yoga and low-packed swimming to reduce stress. Instead of waking up at the crack of dawn to be productive, I slept in until I felt rested. Yet I gained 10 pounds, much to my horror and shame, but then I realized that my inflammatory markers went down, my vitamin deficiency was addressed, my period came back, my acne improved, my mental health improved, my ADHD symptoms lessened, my hair in my head grew back, my hair on my mustache calmed down, my eczema cleared up, my asthma improved, and my insulin levels went down. My doctor was unimpressed with all my improvements because I was not at a healthy weight. She told me I needed to go back to the daily running and calorie restriction. She was fired. Good grab replies. So they replaced swimming with running, and I'm expected to believe any doctor anywhere cares. Both are great cardiovascular exercises. That would be like me saying to a doctor I rode a bike instead of running because I hate running. I don't think my doctor would care, and they'd just be glad I was exercising. Slovenly Haven doesn't believe the story at all, and adds to it. And then my fat-phobic doctor saw me at the grocery store and yelled, You're fat! Put down the cheesecake! Tears running down my face, I had almost given up all hope until a child said, That wasn't nice. She is pretty. The child gave me hope, and then an anchor rose up inside me, and before I knew it, I threw a liter of eggnog at her, and it opened up and she was covered in goo. Everyone at the store clapped, and the child yelled, Take that, doctor! Everyone clapped louder. The child's mother comforted me and called the medical ethics board, and after an investigation, she was fired and had her medical license stripped. That doctor's name, Dr. Linda Hazard, also known as the Fasting Doctor, who killed 14 people by telling them to stop eating. Seriously, look her up. FAs would have a field day with her, but they probably won't, because she just proves starvation mode and set points. That child's name, the future Dr. Lindo Bacon, whose mother is the long-lost daughter of Dr. Mileva Einstein and Dr. Albert Einstein. I got a medal for exposing Dr. Hazard and preventing more deaths. Now nobody can call me fat. Just try. I have eggnog ready for you. I also have a strongly worded template letter of complaint with a self-addressed prepaid envelope where all I have to do is fill in your name. Don't tell me I'm unhealthy, biatches. If you're not a medical doctor practicing in my area, I will have to stick with eggnog. My ending to the story is way better. Ishimura Huntress brings us Hashtag runners are skinny because it's easier to run without dragging extra weight around. I assume they're replying to a post that said that, because the following post takes the exact opposite stance. Not only were two examples I gave here of fat runners, the notes of this post also included fat people who run. I gave a whole body explanation of the plethora of factors that prevent fat people from being in sports you watch. Sorry I don't have the first half of this post, I don't know why they didn't include it. I didn't even go into all the factors I could have, like how fat people are taught from a young age to never take photos or videos of ourselves since we shouldn't have evidence of our hideous existences, let alone put that evidence of our lives on the internet. I sing and have done performances. I even won my university talent contest. The only evidence online of any of those are solely audio recordings because I was taught that my fat body is too ugly and shameful to show evidence of, even when doing what I love and winning an award for it. Do you think that fat people who play sports for fun post videos or photos of themselves on the internet doing so? Where fat folks ridicule their bodies and thin spo jerks puke to their pictures? Where bigots repost fat people's selfies to laugh at them? With their friends and encourage people to harass fat strangers online? I will repeat myself for you. If you don't see fat people in a sport, it's not because we can't play it or be good at it. It's because we're excluded at every single point in the process trying to play that sport and fat people aren't dragging extra weight around. My fat is in my body. There's nothing extra about my body. If I had six fingers on my hands, that isn't extra. That is my body. Fudge you for reading everything I wrote after being vulnerable with you about my childhood trauma with fat phobia and then still deciding to be a fat phobic piece of poop anyway. I don't know what kind of physics denier you have to be to not realize that running when you weigh 500 pounds is harder than running when you weigh 150 pounds. Healthy Car replies, So people don't exist in sports because they're embarrassed to be fat and bullied about it? Also, has anyone looked at pro football? 
oh beasts over there. Informal ad brings us. I see why everyone in New York could be looking good. I'm clearing about 20,000 steps a day just doing normal activities. <laughs> and someone replies, this is how casual fat phobia can be, y'all. Why do I have an account replies? Boo, people are walking and looking healthy. Fart on a cat brings us. That's pretty gross. Unless you've been fat, you don't know what it's like. I push shopping carts five days a week. I walk 12 to 14 miles a day, and I'm still fat because my body is used to all the exercise. So spare me the lectures about diet and exercise. I did lose a lot of weight my first year at the job when I was engaging in muscle confusion, but now my body is used to it, so I've gained 50% of the weight I've lost. I've been doing this for four years. Fart on a Cat explains, muscle confusion was a selling point of P90X, a DVD workout program. It was essentially the idea that you could confuse your muscles by rapidly swapping from exercise to exercise so that you have no time to adapt. Those commercials actually were pretty funny. If you went through the math on many of the people who did the program, they kept talking about their initial weight, final weight, and their percentage change in body fat. But if you went through, you'd notice that people would lose 40 pounds and only change their body fat percentage like 3% or 4% which means that they would lose something like 20 pounds of muscle doing the program. But I guess we weren't supposed to look too closely at the numbers. Invisible Space Vamp replies, I actually gained weight in a similar situation. I had very little time to eat during work, unless it was a very slow news day. I mostly lived off coffee and snacks. Then I got off my shift. I felt like I hadn't eaten anything all day or night, and the food choices I made then were not healthy. Like, I would order takeaway multiple times a week, or would get several sweet breakfast things from the bakery. Basically, I overcompensated for the calories I didn't consume during work. Informal ad brings us. Someone asks, are you not concerned about health complications? Someone replies, I used to say no because I am mentally and chronically ill little goblin girl who saw significant more value in my emotional well-being and self-fulfillment than longevity but now also no, because most obesity-related illnesses aren't that big of a deal. Not shameful, not a failure. Significantly more likely to occur due to genetics than your lifestyle, and straightforward to treat when properly managed. At this point, I'd like to mention that if you get type 2 diabetes at around the age of 30, that cuts your life short by about 10 years. That is a big deal, and that's for people who treat it properly and manage it well. People who don't treat it properly die very quickly. Grouchy reflection brings us, existing happily in a fat body is not glorifying obesity. Okay. We live in a culture that glorifies losing weight no matter the cost. That's not true. We live in a culture that glorifies eating disorders and disordered eating habits and promotes them as health and wellness. You have to have a really distorted point of view if you think things like Eating healthy food and counting your calories are disordered eating habits. We live in a culture that glorifies thin, almost prepubescent looking bodies and claims that everyone can be thin if they just eat right and exercise. So much for body positivity, now they're just insulting people who are thinner than them. We live in a culture where people would rather die than gain weight or be fat, as if being fat is some sort of unconscionable crime. I don't really know what they're replying to here, because I've never heard anybody say that. I'm not going to hate my body just because society tells me I should. I'm not going to hate my body just because you do. You cannot hate yourself into something that you can love. Fat people are allowed to exist without the world yelling at them to change all the fudging time. As Gordon Ramsay so eloquently put it, where there's fat, there's flavor. And that's the vibe for the new year. That post, I kind of understood where they were going, till the end, where they seemed to be recommending that people eat them. Why did it turn into a pro-cannibalism post right at the end? That was totally unexpected. Get in the Basement brings us. So I'm reading You Just Need to Lose Weight by Aubrey Gordon, 
And she's talking about the whole glorifying obesity rhetoric and how it's rooted in anti-fat like disgust. And it's making me think about how it would be funny to comment on a thin person's Insta. Don't you think you're glorifying thinness? Except I realized, yeah, they literally are. Every body check thirst trap or diet advice TikTok someone makes is literally glorifying thinness as the ideal. Yes, yes, they are. They derive value from thin privilege. Therefore, they want thinness to continue to be privileged. I'd like to mention that I didn't even know these things existed. The fact that they know they existed suggests that they were searching for them, or that something in their search history suggested to the algorithm that they would be interested in it. So the fact that they're seeing these things says something about them. Catton replies, So they're allowed to show off their bodies with all the sexy bikini lingerie-clad pics they want, but we can't simply post gym selfies or OOTD pictures because we're body-checking. Is it body checking and glorifying thinness, or are you just insecure because they have a body you want? Get in the basement brings us. Desexualized inspirational comments about really hot or sexy fat women you would be drooling over if they were thin is also a form of fat phobia, and everyone is way too comfortable viewing a fit, hot, gorgeous fat woman as your personal guardian angel. I know sometimes a fat woman is trying to be inspiring, but it's just insane how desexualized the comments are of a beautiful woman in tight outfits with her belly showing boobies, bouncing, sweating, and working out. Hashtag apparently I'm a massive pervert, only in relation to fat women in comparison to this site. Get in the basement replies to them. I can't begin to tell you how much I despise the notion that in order to prove that you truly respect a person or group, you have to openly profess how much you find that person or group worthy of getting cookies. And a lot of people who regurgitate this often have a lot of deep-seated self-acceptance issues of their own and try to cloak it in a very faux-progressive or disingenuous way by equating how much you want to give somebody cookies with support acceptance. To add to this, I understand that it's human nature to want to be desired by others, but as someone that has had multiple people try to aggressively pursue me into sex dates that I did not want to have in real life, including pulling the Find me attractive or you're the bigot uppity one card. My patients really only go so far for this mentality. You aren't entitled to other people's attraction, sexual or otherwise, period. Hefty Dig brings us. It's really unfortunate that medical professionals are taught to just assume that if it's inconvenient for them to administer treatment or test a fat person, that it's the fat person's fault. No consideration is given to the possibility that it's because of inadequate equipment or institutionalized fat phobia resulting in a lack of innovation and techniques and technology to accommodate patients. I had to get an x-ray for my back recently, and on the report it said, results inconclusive due to patient body habitus, which is medical speak for patient is too fat for our x-ray machine to create a clear image. Imagine if this report had been written to say, results inconclusive due to insufficient or incorrect imaging technology. Imagine a medical system that cares enough about fat people and providing them with adequate treatment that it seeks out real solutions instead of just telling people to lose weight, which everyone who bothers to look into it knows is not a real solution at all. Invisible Space Vamp replies, Since the radiation is as low as possible, things that are in the way can create shadows in the images. I once asked a technician why I had to wear only a top for my torso x-ray because, Can't you see through my cardigan? She said machines with higher radiation could, but that wouldn't be in the patient's best interest, of course. So, in other words, what they're really asking for here is for the x-ray machine to give them cancer so that they can get a better image. You know what I'm going to say? No thank you. I'm sure the technology is slowly getting better for this kind of thing, but it's going to take a while. And in the meantime, I don't think we should just be blasting the heck out of people just to get a slightly clearer image. Chivrio brings us, Don't think skinny people, and yes, I'm including skinny people who think they're mid-sized, understand how ridiculous they sound when they make up these fat activist boogeymen who are all allegedly harassing them for eating a fruit. Y'all realize that most fat people have spent our entire lives being harassed and criticized for eating food, especially in public, right? You realize that people feel entitled to approach random fat strangers in public and literally take our food away because they don't think we deserve it. People we don't even know will walk right up to us and slap the food right out of our hands, and the rest of the world thinks they've done us a favor. You know, this might happen in junior high. This might happen in high school. 
but there's no way it happens anywhere else. This is a made-up story. They continue, and you think we'll turn around and harass someone else for what they're eating? Like, do you realize this scenario you've concocted is one of massive projection? It's embarrassing, and you should shut the fudge up. Haribu Vrishish replies, I think it's exactly the reverse. Might be totally wrong, though. Can only speak from experience, and my experience is that people harass me for eating too little and being too skinny all the time at the office, just because I don't eat big meals at noon. Don't want to get sleepy in the afternoon. Have never seen fat co-workers being harassed for eating burgers, fries, and an ice cream at noon, as it being too much. It is true, however, that fat co-workers are usually the ones doing the harassment. But that doesn't go with OOP's narrative. Cialt replies, Someone please snap a picture of those ever-elusive people who steal food from F.A. shopping carts to me. They're the F.A. equivalent of Bigfoot. Lots of anonymous testimonies, but nowhere to be found. Grouchy Reflection brings us. If you haven't intentionally unlearned your fat phobia, chances are you are still fat phobic. Fat activism is life saving. Fat activism is life changing. Is it though? Near as I can tell, fat activism is killing a lot of people every year. And killing them young. My body does not need to be smaller to be worthy. I am deserving of food no matter my size. It's cool to be visibly fat. Fat posse affirmations. Much of what is blamed on fatness is actually the result of weight stigma. You know, there's like one study that sort of shows this, but the problem with it is it's all based on surveys. And it wasn't 100% conclusive, and it also in no way showed that all illnesses that fat people have are caused by weight stigma. But let's continue. Weight stigma is discrimination or stereotyping based on someone's weight. This includes things like Thinking if someone is above a certain weight, they must be unhealthy. They must be sedentary. They must eat so bad, as if the moralization of food is ever a good thing. Weight stigma keeps people from proper medical care, from social activities, from exercise, and generally just messes with fat people's quality of life. You cannot know someone's health, status, diet, or activity level by looking at them, and you're not entitled to their disclosure. The University of Illinois Chicago created a great page all about weight stigma. Grouchy Reflection replies, Fat activism is life-saving? Mate, tell that to the 20-plus and counting. Fat activist, fat activism adjacent influencers who died over the past couple of years. You know, I can only think of a few that died, so I'm not sure what they're referring to here. Most fat activists or fat activism people are in their 20s or 30s. So while they're getting unhealthy fast, they're usually not on the verge of dying yet. They reply to the fat activism is life-changing. Sure it is. Lots of girls in the ex-fat acceptance community have health complications thanks to their time in the cult. Fluffy Kitten brings us. We live in a white supremacist, patriarchal society. Fat phobia exists to control and oppress women, and even more so, other and make wrong, specifically non-white female bodies. White women's prescribed thinness is in direct relation to deeply embedded racism. It's a way to divide and separate us. A relaxed, Healthy, strong female presenting body is threatening to patriarchy and white supremacy. When we call ourselves fat, we are calling ourselves wrong. We are saying anyone who is fat is also wrong. It's not a private insult. It is an internalized argument with our external systems that there's a right way to be, that some bodies are right bodies. That way of thinking is not private. It affects us all. It becomes our culture, our community. Xion replies to a relaxed, healthy, strong female is about the furthest thing from a fat activist. Y'all are only threatening to your own health. Grouchy Reflection brings us. How would it feel to hold the possibility that gaining weight, getting fat, or staying fat would not be as awful as you were taught to believe it would be? What if what you were taught is truth is not truth at all? What if you have been working so hard to avoid or change something that never needed to be avoided or changed? What if all that you were taught about bodies and fatness is wrong? What if it wouldn't be so awful? What if it wouldn't feel so bad? And maybe it will feel awful and bad because of how deeply internalized anti-fat bias is and how you still have to spend time with people who judge your body and you still have to navigate a world with so much weight stigma. And if it does feel that bad, what if it won't feel that way forever? What if eventually there will be a way out of the awful? Because living according to the lies you were taught about bodies will not offer you a way out. It's always a trap. 
a setup to feel bad, to think you're bad. Is it possible to keep going, to let your body grow and expand, to let it be whatever size it's going to be? Is it possible to tolerate it little by little? Is it possible that it will eventually be easier than just tolerating it? Is it possible that one day it will feel different than it does right now? You know, they're not really selling their idea to me by using the word tolerate. I would rather feel good than feel like I tolerate my body. Honestly, do they hear themselves? They continue, what might it feel like just to hold the possibility that gaining weight, getting fat, or staying fat will not be as awful as you were taught it would be? Implying that it will still be awful, just not as awful. Invisible Space Vamp replies, if I have to live in a world of what-ifs and make-believes, I'd rather have magic and dragons and time travel and all the other fun stuff, not getting out of breath from running up some stairs. Kiwi Koala brings us. This is a health risk assessment they took at work. They put in their BMI as 22.7, and the health risk assessment recommends they get their BMI below 20. Kiwi Koala adds, For context, I work for a health-based company, and this is part of their yearly health assessment for employees. We get Amazon money for completing it. I'm in the yellow range despite being at a perfectly healthy BMI, and their BMI chart says that 20 or less is ideal. That puts me with less than 10 pounds before I hit underweight. That puts me below blood donation thresholds. Then literally on the next page it tells me that the ideal range for my height is 105 to 140 pounds. Right after the stupid slider telling me the low risk range has me under 113 pounds. This is a health company promoting heroin chic ideals. And it's incredibly frustrating, and I can absolutely see how this sort of thing could push people further into the fat acceptance movement out of pure spite and frustration. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with being on the lower end of the healthy range, but the way it is presented here is ridiculous. I thought this news article was interesting but weird. MIT scientists are working on a vibrating obesity pill. There's not much to say about it, except it's simply a pill that vibrates that you swallow and then it passes through your body undigested. I can't believe anyone would think this is a good idea. It sounds like the kind of thing you'd be miserable from beginning to the very end when it finally shook its way out of your body. This is the kind of thing somebody said, yes, that's a good idea, but it's got so many problems, let's not even go there. Like, for example, imagine if the pill bursts open, instead you've just got the little tiny motor shaking inside you without the protective coating. So now it's going to rip everything up from your stomach on down. That would be a massive lawsuit if it doesn't kill you outright. Vindicator brings us. This is from 1992, the New England Journal of Medicine. Discrepancy between self-reported and actual caloric intake and exercises in obese subjects. So this is one of the early studies trying to explain why obese people have a hard time losing weight on a calorie-restricted diet. It has two groups. Group one is nine women and one man with a history of diet resistance. Group two is just people with no history of diet resistance. What they found is that for the people who didn't succeed well on diets, is that their total energy expenditure and resting metabolic rate was within 5% of the predicted values for their body size. Therefore, it wasn't low energy expenditure that was the reason that they couldn't lose weight. But they did find that the subjects in group one, the one that didn't succeed well in diets, underreported their actual food intake by about 50% and overreported their physical activity by about 50%. Some people going so high as 125% overestimating their physical activity. That's like saying you went for a two hour run when in fact you only went for 45 minutes. It's a huge difference. They go on to say that people in group one who had diet resistance blamed genetics as the cause for their obesity, used thyroid medication at a high frequency, and described their eating behavior as relatively normal. So they conclude by saying the reason many people fail at diets is because they underreport how many calories they intake and overreport how many calories they burn. Just for reference, this is not the only study about this. This has been confirmed many times with larger groups of people as well. And you can see visual confirmation too of it anytime you want by watching Secret Eaters. 
where people really think that if you don't watch them eat the sandwich or the cookies that the calories don't count. I thought this was interesting too. This is from NYU Research. What really happens when a grocery store opens in a so-called food desert? As you know, most fat activists blame food deserts as a reason that people are obese. But does it actually make sense? What they found, through studying, was that while it's true that people in food deserts tend to buy fewer healthy groceries than people in wealthier neighborhoods, they do not start buying healthier groceries after a new supermarket opened. Instead, we find that the people shop at the new supermarket and then buy the same kinds of groceries they've been buying before. That is to say that the food desert isn't to blame, it's their own purchasing habits. And then what happens after that is the supermarket will change what they have in stock to match what people in that neighborhood are actually buying, and pretty soon they won't be selling healthy foods any longer. So, believe it or not, at some level, people in food deserts are causing their own problem. I guess that's an uncomfortable truth. You've made it to the end of another video. Thank you to everybody who's watched this far. Click like if you liked the video, and if you really liked it, consider clicking subscribe. If you truly enjoyed the video, consider becoming a member. People at the very highest level get one short video every couple weeks of about one to two minutes. People at the top two levels get their usernames read out publicly. Speaking of which, special thanks go out to Emmett McNally, Cupcake or Death, MMC, Just a Girl, That One Guy, Wolf Child Rusk, Maria P, Syringa H, Grey Warden Invasion, Rue the Viewer, and Taylor Morris. I wish all of you wonderful people a wonderful day.